Judges chapter 3, verse 31. Holy Ghost just left me. I don't know what happened. Wow. Okay, then. The Lord uh, helped me with this message, and I hope that it will help you, makes you um, more appreciative of the little things in life. Go to Judges chapter 3, verse 31. This passage talks about one of the deliverers of Israel. Some people assume that he's the third judge of Israel. I'm not sure if that's true or not. However, there was no doubt that he was like one of the judges who delivered the children of Israel from their enemies. If you know the story, the nation of Israel, they had a history of constant, constantly disobeying God. And then when the Lord delivered them to their enemies, then they were delivered by the judges. The judges rescued them. And as long as the judges ruled, the nation of Israel lived right. But when the judge died, then the children of Israel messed up again. And then the Lord delivered them to their enemies again. And the judge had to deliver the Jews again. And on and on the cycle goes. Within that cycle, one of them was involved. And there's only one or two verses that would mention about this individual, if not a few. The Bible says, and after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. Not much detail about this person, and not a lot of information that you and I would want to know. I'm sure Shamgar himself would probably think, wouldn't it be natural if you're talking about the book of Judges, of all these deliverers, you'd give me a little bit more information. But there was only one verse that mentions about Shamgar. Now, if he killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad, it's like a piece of stick with a little blade at the end that's used as a tip to kind of uh, prod the cattle or push them a bit. I mean, wouldn't you like to know more information about that? Something very special, but the Lord didn't give much information. Something so basic, yet it was something so powerful. And I wish that the Lord would give more information, but he didn't because he wants to keep it basic. He wants to keep it very little. If you and I know about our God's personalities, he keeps things very basic. He keeps things very little. And that's something that you and I do not like. The evidences are hustle and bustle of this advancing education and society and technology. We just want things bigger. That's why we build skyscrapers. That's why we try to shoot for the moon with satellites. That's the reason why we build a Tower of Babel. Mankind, human nature, they want something that will solve or resolve problems easily. That's what technology is for, is to solve your problem just like that. If you have a certain need, you want that taken care of. If you and I have a painful issues, we want the strongest medication because we just want the pain to go away. We don't care about how effective the treatment is or how long the treatment takes or the best advice of doctors. We would prefer to throw it all, the, all away so that we can get a quick, strong med just to get the pain over with and move on with our lives. Human nature is built upon quick and easy solutions. And how in this day and age can we overcome problems? You know, when we, you and I go through problems in life, try as we might to overcome them ourselves, it can be just too difficult there are certainly problems that you feel like are impossible that you cannot conquer. Temptations you just cannot kick off. Trials that you feel like cannot be overcome. And you heard every method and tip and answer to conquer the issues, but they don't work. You try to get people praying for you. You try to tell and share your burdens to others. You try to get counsel from other people. And the worst thing that can happen is that instead of those things helping you, those things can actually discourage you. As a pastor and as a person myself, I know what it's like to resort to counsel from good preachers, from 
elderly people, uh, being a Korean myself, that's quite a habit on my part, and unfortunately, you're not going to get every advisor that's a good advisor, and they can misunderstand you, give you wrong advice, or you feel hurt in the end, and you don't want to ask more advice after that. I understand that. That's the reason why I take pastoring and counseling extremely seriously, because I've been hurt myself. And I'm sure that you've been hurt yourself. So at that point, what can we do? We just feel trapped. When we feel trapped, we keep trying to find faster solutions, bigger methods that can conquer the bigger problems, and we try everything or anything in this life that can solve it, but you can't find it, can you? Because no such thing exists. As much as we want them, we don't get it. How many of you feel like that with a certain struggle or trial or problem you're going through? Now, let's add 600 problems to that, not just one. Right? When one problem happens, then another one just has to come in. And here you have brothers, sisters in Christ who are supposed to understand you, help you, but they don't. And then you try everything in the world and that doesn't help you. Now, that's why people commit suicide. That's why people always get discouraged. Or people, they just say, I just have to go through it. I just have to bear it. But believe it or not, the solutions are effective and powerful and they are right at your fingertips, believe it or not. And I'm not just going to say nonchalantly or easily that it's prayer or it's the word of God, or it's God. I'm not going to say it that way. Those are the solutions at your fingertips, and they do work, but the reason why I'm not going to give an answer like that is because they don't work for you. So let me translate it to this way. Prayer, Bible reading, and God do help you. They are effective, but let me translate it to something else. You ready for this? Basic. Basics do help. Basics help you. But why don't they work for you? Why aren't you content with it? Why aren't you happy? I strongly believe you're not using those basics well. We overpass them because we keep trying to find a better solution, a stronger medication, or a quicker way. And because of that, we feel like that there's nothing out there. And then we feel trapped and we feel like we have to use our own strength and our own effort to overcome it and it's just life. I've got to grit my teeth and go through it. And I believe that's absolutely wrong. I believe that you do have the solution and those are the basics. Amen. And those basics do help, they do work, but you're not using them. Or you don't even understand them. Or worse, worse, you don't see them. The solution's right in front of your face, but you don't even see it because you don't even know they exist. You feel like there is no solution. That's why you don't even know that those solutions exist. Now, 600 Philistines is quite a feat with something so basic like a stick, right? Shamgar had a basic weapon, <laughs> not even a sword, not even a dagger, just an ox goad. Just a piece of stick. And it slaughtered 600 problems. Wouldn't you like to do that? I would like to talk about how to kill 600 problems with a stick. Let's pray. Now, Father, fill within me Holy Ghost unction and power and the cleansing of your blood. I pray today's preaching will be eye-opening, will be very helpful. It helped me, Lord. It helped me so much, Lord. And I pray that it will help these people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first point is the timing of the stick. The timing of the stick. Now notice the first part of the verse, it says, and after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath. In order for a basic weapon like an ox goat to slaughter 600 problems in his life, it had to come at a certain timing. Now the timing of this deliverer Shamgar was not instantaneous. It was not like, hey, I got 600 problems right here. Let's get to work and I'm going to solve it all just like that. The timing here was a lot more slower. It was a lot more tedious, painful, meticulous. And here's another thing. 
as he was trying to solve the problem with his stick, it didn't fully resolve the problem either. You might say, but the Bible says he delivered. He delivered the Jews from the Philistines. Yeah, it did, but it didn't completely deliver the Jews. Didn't you know that? You might say, why is that? Because notice before Shamgar, who was the one that delivered Israel? The Bible says in verse 30, so Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest four score years. Okay, so Moab, their enemies were conquered, and the one who delivered them was Ehud at verse 26, correct? All right, so notice right here, Ehud delivered Israel. The next one you would think would be Shamgar delivering Israel. But believe it or not, it's not. It's not. It's actually, when you go to Judges chapter 5, Judges 5, it's actually Deborah delivering them from the Canaanites. From the Canaanites. Look at Judges chapter 5. Notice the Bible says what Deborah sang at verse 6. In verse 6, Deborah sang, In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied. And the travelers walked through byways. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. Why, Deborah was singing that during the days of Shamgar, the Jews were still oppressed. They weren't delivered, they were oppressed. But I thought that Shamgar delivered the Jews. So what was going on? Shamgar only delivered them from part of the problem. That was the Philistines. But it wasn't just Philistines. The overall problem, the complete problem, was the Canaanites. Philistines was just part of the problem. So in other words, Shamgar delivered Israel only partially. It was a partial deliverance. It wasn't a complete deliverance. Don't get me wrong. The deliverance was complete in conquering the Philistines but not the whole problem, which is the Canaanites. As a matter of fact, the Jews were suffering the same problem for years, even during Shamgar's time, possibly. Because if you look at chapter 4, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, that after Ehud died, the Bible says that the Jews were in bondage by the Canaanites. It never said Philistines. It never said Shamgar delivered them from the problem. It said after Ehud died, the Jews were bound by a problem until Deborah came. Which means that during Shamgar's time, they weren't delivered. Look at Judges chapter 4 and verse 1. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin king of Canaan that reigned in Hazor. Look at uh, verse 3. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, not Shamgar, Deborah, a prophetess, she came to the scene and delivered Israel. So 20 years they were in bondage. Even when Shamgar delivered them, they were still in bondage. For how long? 20 years. You know what uh, you have to understand about God's way of deliverance for you in life? Is that it will not resolve the entire problem just like that. The timing of that doesn't work. That's our fleshly problem is that we want anything to solve our health problem like that. The core issues. We just want it solved. We just want it gone. If we got family problems... We want one thing to solve it all just like that. If we got problems in this ministry and church, we just want to get the problems over with and done. Get it fixed. But timing doesn't work like that when you want to free yourself from problems. What happens is it can go many years long. But I thought God delivers. I thought God saves. Yes, he does. But he won't solve your entire problem like that. What he does is he finds the real, the actual problems within that, within that full problem. And then he takes those partial problems within the bigger picture of the problems and say, 
this is the actual problem that you have that you're going through that you don't know yet that needs to be solved first. And once we fix this one, then it will hit the complete picture of the full problem after that. That's the problem with you and I, because if you're addicted to a sin and then you go like, oh man, uh, I want to be free from this sin problem. Why won't I be free like that? No child, that's not it. You got to look at today. Deliver yourself from today. If you don't deliver yourself from today, you're not going to deliver yourself from that addiction for the rest of your life. Look at the Philistine, huh? 600 Philistines. Isn't that a whopping problem already? Look at the Philistines. Not at the whole Canaanite problem. That's the timing of God works. But I want the Canaanites gone out of my life. God, I want to conquer the Canaanites, get rid of them. And God's like, no, 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 look at those Philistines. Come on. Those Philistines are still running rampant. 600 of them, you're going to leave those things be? And you're going to abandon this problem, the Philistines, for the bigger problem, Canaanites? If you can't handle the little problem first, you won't handle the bigger problem. Let me repeat that again. If you won't handle the little problem first, you won't handle the bigger problem. You know what the real problem is you want to be delivered? The real problem you want to be delivered is that Philistine, not the Canaanite. Because God knows the actual problem is not the pain you're going through in your health. Your real problem is you don't have appreciation thanksgiving to God. And God's like, we got to work on that actual problem. Oh, no, no, God. The problem is this disease and pain. If you, it would just go away, I can serve you better. And God's like, no, 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 because I know that if I give you good health, you still won't serve me better. Come on, come on. You need to have appreciation thanksgiving. Yeah, appreciate. that's, what you, that's why I sent you this problem. So until you get, fight the real problem first, yeah. which is learning to appreciate the little things in life. Using every opportunity of your strength, of your health to serve God. Then let's talk about the Canaanite problem after that. No, your problem is not finances where your money's running out. And if God would just send you more money, then it would be taken care of. No, 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 no. The real problem is today. What am I going to eat? The real problem is today. What am I going to do with this bill? And God sends in that little handful of purpose, that mail that comes in the check, some brother and sister in Christ that will help you out, somebody who offers to help you out, give you food, pull you through a problem. That's the deliverance you got to be looking at, not your debts wiped out. You got to look at that deliverance where God said, see, I gave you money in the mailbox. And you would take it with appreciation and say, thank God I got delivered from the problem. You would say it that way rather than, oh God, that still don't solve my debts. Come on, come on, brother. Three, three, three. You know, you got to look at little by little. Those are the real problems. Amen. You know what your real problem is? Those little things, not the big things. Right. You are blinded by the devil, the world, and the flesh, which makes everything so complicated and makes you see the bigger problem as the real problem. But no, the real problem are those little things that you overlooked. That's right. That's good and that is what? You need your p impatience. That's, right. That's the real problem. You couldn't wait day by day. What's your real problem? Lack of faith. That's your real problem. You don't learn to trust God with any problem you're going through. What's the real problem? The real problem is not joy. Lack of joy. You need to have joy no matter what storm you're going through in life. Those are the real problems. Because if God made everything good, cleared up the bigger problems, you will still struggle with those little problems. See, those little problems are not so little after all, are they? No, they're the real problems. They're the core problems. And once God delivers you from the real, from the actual problem, and you slaughter that Philistine, guess what? That doesn't mean your full problem solved. The timing, like the Bible says, 20 years they were in bondage. 20 years they were in bondage. But a person would think that he or she is delivered if they were to look at the actual problem, which is the Philistine, rather than the Canaanite. And then it doesn't matter how many years you live your Christian life with problem after problem after problem after problem, you can still live a life of deliverance 
because those little problems are conquered and they don't rule over you anymore. Amen. So you feel like you're in bondage for many years with a certain problem? Well, thank God where God got rid of the actual problems within that bigger problem, isn't it? Those little details you overlooked? What was it? Your impatience. What was it? Your lack of love. What was it? Your lack of faith. What was it? Not learning to trust God. What was it? Those stubborn, prideful parts you refused to surrender. Those are the things that, that have to be delivered and conquered. Amen. That's the, you got to look at the timing of everything. If you keep looking at the Canaanite, the Canaanite, then you will never be delivered. Look at the Philistine, the Philistine, and then you'd be surprised how many times God delivered you. The next part in verse 31 is, which slew of the Philistine 600 men. Which slew of the Philistine 600 men. The second point is the turmoil of the stick. The turmoil of the stick. We saw the timing of the stick. Is that it doesn't resolve everything just like that. It goes little by little by little. Actually focusing on the real core problems. Not the false full problem. But now we're going to look at the turmoil that the stick goes through. As you hold that basic solution, that basic stick, it's going to conquer any conflict that you go through in life. But as you go through turmoil, like I told you before, what we want to do is solve it all just like that. What we want to do is get rid of the big ones, the real big ones. We, human nature is always looking at big things, bigger things, not the little things. Not the basic things. You as Shamgar, you take that stick, and then when you see those 600 Philistines, you know what you do? You're like, I'm going to get it all. I'm going to slaughter them all in one day. I'm going to make sure that I finish this in five minutes. Really? With a stick? The Bible never said how long Shamgar fought. For all you know, it was hours. Maybe days. He didn't kill all of his enemies at once. You think that's how life works, Shamgar? That you can take the basic thing God has given to you and just kill all your 600 problems at once? What if it's one at a time, huh? You might say, why do I have to do it one at a time? Because you're going to die. Simple. You think you can kill 600 problems at once with a piece of stick? That's not how you're going to survive. You're going to have to pace yourself. You're going to have to take breaks. You're going to have to breathe in and out and then take time in prayer, Bible reading, fellowship with brethren. And you're going to have to pace and put up, uh, refresh yourself with spiritual, spiritual support and pace and pace and pace until those 600 problems are gone. That's right. You're not going to take one med and then solve it all. Trust me, one day of prayer and Bible reading is not going to solve your problem like that. It could take years, That's right. years. And that's how it works. Amen. I don't like it. I want to kill 600 problems like that. Then you're going to die. How well are you doing right now with your shortcuts? With your fast, ease, so-called easy methods? How are you doing so far? I'll tell you what, and I guarantee you this, you're not in peace with God. Preach, I'll tell you what, and I'll guarantee this much, you're miserable. I'll tell you this much, and I guarantee this much, is that you're stressing out. You still feel trapped, don't you? You know why? You're not going one at a time. And you're killing yourself. You know how you're going to kill 600 enemies? I bet you Shamgar, he paced himself. It's a stick for crying out loud. It's a stick. Do you think when he comes up to one Philistine that he just touch, pokes him with the stick and the Philistine dies? Or do you think that he had to poke him once and poke him again and poke him and poke him? And then find out that the armor is too thick that the ox go can't go through. And he has to find a vital area. He has to research further on that one Philistine problem. One Philistine problem. Not 600, but one. And then look at that vital area and say, there's that neck. That's what I missed out. Jab! And then you kill it. And then once you get that down... Then the second Philistine is a lot more manageable, a lot more stress-free, isn't it? 
You don't have to hit the armor wrongly again and then you go, no, no, vital point, neck. And then now you can hit problem number three and four more with ease now, right? Why? Because you have to start with number one first, not 600 like that. And you've just been hitting their armor here and there and they're just laughing at you. The problems are laughing at you, mocking you, wearing you out and just say, keep hitting me. You're just wasting your energy. You're going to break down and give up on God. You're going to bow to me, the problems say. The problems say you're going to bow and cry to me one day. You know why? You refuse to start with problem one and concentrate on problem one. You know what we do with, when 600 problems come at us? We want to hit the big ones, right? So then we see big Philistines over here and there, and we're like, man, that problem looks like the toughest, so I'm going to conquer that one first. Man, I'm, that is so tough, witnessing, winning souls to Jesus Christ. I'm going to go all in and study everything in pastors' discipleship classes and soul win and then just soul win myself, witness like there's no tomorrow. And then when you start doing that, you get discouraged when you do a poor job in witnessing. You get discouraged because there's something that comes up in your home or in your personal life that prevents you from coming to witnessing that day. And that's why you easily throw in the towel and you haven't been witnessing for a long time, correct? You know why? That big problem first. That big Philistine. That guy is seven foot tall like Max. I'm going to kill him first. No, then they'll kill you first. You know what you do? Where's that little Philistine there that I overlooked? I need to kill him first. So I kill him that way. All right, then let's get a little taller guy here. A little taller problem. This is how you conquer that. All right, I think I can do now two of those guys at once. There it is. There it is. And then finally, after constant faithfulness of experience in conquering those little problems... Now here comes the big Philistine problem. Now here's the seven foot tall guy and you can stab him and kill him like that. I know why you keep swinging away at your ox goat Shamgar and you want to kill them all because you see too many Philistines, 600, too many problems. And here's one probably terrorizing one house right here and another Philistine, probably half a mile away, terrorizing that family right there, slaughtering them, and you're only one person, you can't go and save two houses like that, can you? But see, when you see so many needs and burdens, you're forced into a predicament where I gotta save two houses. That's not how it works. I don't care how great the need or the burden is, you're only one man, you're going to have to pick one burden, one need, one problem to overcome, and then the next burden and problem to overcome. You know why you're stressing yourself so, so much out? Because you feel like you have to help everybody, save everybody from this problem. And here you are trying to save your loved one, trying to save your family, trying to save your church and brothers and sisters in Christ around you and then lost souls, and here you are trying to do everything that you could rather than trusting God, trusting those souls, those people's lives to God. And you feel like you have to play superhero and, and rescue five different houses which are miles and distances and worlds apart, and you're only one man, one woman, you can't save at all. You want to save them all? Then pick one house to save, then go to the next one. Well, they're, they're getting hurt. They're getting terrorized. i got to deliver them. Let God handle that. God knows what he's doing. Prioritize. Pick the priority. This problem. And once you rescue that house, then save the next house, Shamgar. I don't think that he just took one whopping stick and went through 600 and killed them all like that. I'm sure he had to do a lot of running from house to house. I'm pretty sure he had to take one Philistine at a time. He couldn't save them all. You don't know. You never know. Maybe those Philistines slaughtered some innocent people there. You think Shamgar saved all of them? Here's another thing. Let's even assume Shamgar 
the Lord did a miracle in your life, you took that little ox go, that stick, that piece of sick stick, and just slaughtered 600 problems like that, then you know what's going to happen after that? That don't stop, solve your Philistine problem. The Philistines are going to come back again, Shamgar. As a matter of fact, they come back again in several books of your Bible. They come back at 1 Samuel, and they come back at 2 Samuel. And they lived on through, those Philistines lived on through dozens of judges. So let's say you slaughtered, killed 600 problems. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm done. I finally put that problem behind me. Hey, if you are 40 years old, you still probably got 40 years of your life of problems left. You think you solved this problem? Oh, I can move on with my life? <laughs> You're in La La Land. There will be a Goliath about 30 chapters later. A Goliath, which is a much bigger problem than 600 Philistines maybe. Goliath will come out maybe five years later or tomorrow, I don't know. But guess what? You can solve all your problems right now. They ain't going to solve it all. They're going to come back again. So you know what you need to do? I know you don't want to do it. I know you want to get the problem over with, but that's not how it works. You're going to have to kill one enemy at a time. And then you're going to have to kill basic, just basic. And then a bigger basic, a bigger basic, a bigger basic, then a bigger basic. And by the way, when Goliath comes, you're not going to use a big sword to chop off his head. You're going to have to take a basic thing like a piece of stone and a sling. And that basic thing will conquer your Goliath. And if you can't use your basic ox goad right now on your current problems, you're not going to trust God with your Goliath of a problem with your piece of stone. Because you overlook those basic things. It's just a piece of stone. It's just a piece of stick. Why bother? My third point is the tip of the stick. The tip of the stick. The Bible says in Judges 3.31, with an ox goad, with an ox goad. When you look at that ox goad, that was the deadly part of the weapon. That was the one that killed the enemy, is that tip of the stick, that little blade that comes out of it. Now that tip of the stick was enough where it can kill and slaughter 600 enemies, 600 Philistines. The tip of a stick. He didn't use a sword, you notice that? He never used a shield. He never used some secret weapon, some atomic bomb, boom, all right, man, I got rid of 600 Philistines like that. No, the Lord used the tip of a stick. And that was what he used to overcome his problems. You know what your problem is, is that uh, when God uses the tip of a stick for your problems, you don't like that, obviously. You're trying to search for some atomic bomb out there that would resolve it. So you resort to the ways of the world, the methods and weapons of the world to conquer your problems, don't you? Well, a simple question I want to ask you is, how are you faring with that so far? <laughs> it didn't wipe out your enemies, did it? No, it didn't. So you know what you're going to have to use? You're going to have to use the tip of the stick. And that tip of the stick will kill. It will kill your enemies. Now, your problem is you don't appreciate that tip of the stick, that little blade. You're looking for a bigger blade or a bigger weapon that would conquer the problems. By doing that, then what happens is, then when God gives you weapons in your life to conquer problems, you will not accept any weapons that he gives to you except the weapons that you prefer. Come on. Let me translate it to another thing. No matter what blessing God gives to you in your life, even if it's the biggest blessing, it will mean nothing to you except the blessing that you prefer. Let me translate it to something else. No matter how much God intervenes or provides for your behalf, 
you will feel like that you have not been supported until you get the need and the provision that you, you prefer. Come on. Want me to translate more to you? I'll translate more to you. The people that God has put into your life, the things that God has put into your life, the incidents and the things and the scenarios God has put to you, gave to you in your life, there will be absolutely no appreciation for them whatsoever unless God gives the things that, and the people and the events that you prefer. But if we take time to look at that tip of the, of the stick and go, man, this thing is so valuable. How come I didn't see that before? Oh, it's the tip of a stick. Tip of a stick, big deal. No, 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 no. Uh, there's something... Uh, I overlook, let's look at that. Wow, that blade is actually sharp. Wow, this thing can actually kill. If I used that little blade in this way, it can overcome the problem this way. That's how I can use it. Why haven't I ever thought of it that way before? If I only just took time to contemplate, to study, to appreciate, to look more carefully into that, little blade, that tip of the stick, I could have used it better to help me with more problems in life. Why didn't I? Yeah, why didn't you? You know why? Because you think it's the tip of a stick, that's why. You think it's something you already tried, but it didn't work. No, I'll tell you why it didn't work. You didn't take time to look at that little blade, did you? You didn't take time to appreciate that little blade, didn't you? You didn't take time to use that little blade in any way you can, did you? You didn't take time to pray or thank the Lord for that little blade, did you? You didn't change your fleshly perspective and looked at the value of a little blade and said, wow, this actually helps me a lot with this. You didn't, did you? You know why? You're a fast-paced American. Oh, I know that, I know that, oh, yeah, I know that, I know that. I tried that, I know that. No, you didn't try it hard enough. You didn't look at it hard enough. You didn't study it. Look at it hard enough. Look at that little tip of the stick again. Can I tell you that? Here's a little tip of the stick. Look at this again, will you please? And don't think it's just folded hands saying a whole bunch of words. Look at this tip of the stick again, will you please? And say, I am talking to the creator of the universe here. Amen. That's the tip of the stick. I have access to the throne of glory. That's the tip of the stick. I have a God who knows the past, present, and future, and it, everything is being answered the right time, the right way. Right. Take a look at that again. Take a look at that again. Don't just go, I pray, I tried it. No, you did not. Come on. Take some time and look at what you're doing. And pay attention to the results, too. You, you overpassed the results of this, didn't you? How many prayers has God answered already for you with this? And you think this doesn't work? You know what your problem is? Fast-paced American. Oh, I tried this. I tried that. It don't work. It don't work. It don't work. You didn't take time to look at this result, did you? But if you took time to look at this result, perhaps there would be more faith this time in your next prayer with the next problem you know why there are so many divorces so many families and homes being broken up they don't appreciate those tip of the stick God gave to them do you realize what you have is so valuable and real you ever wondered why people are so inhumane that there are pregnant mothers who would do abortion, or even if the babies gets born, they would kill them? You ever wondered what? They don't appreciate those little, those little things. They don't see value in the little things, do they? But if they were to look at the value of the little thing, rather than looking at the defects of the little thing, problems with the little thing, and looking at bigger blades out there that are more preferable, rather than this little one, that's why they're so ungrateful, discontent. And they think their life is unfair. But you take that little thing again and look at your son or daughter and your wife and your husband. And look at the family and the household God has given to you and just take time that they're mine. 
the miracle of life, someone to love, and yes, someone to actually disagree and fight. Just, just having that. Yeah, the Lord taught me that after being single for so many years. That I don't care what hell I had to go through. I was very thankful with my family that I got. Because I knew what it was like being alone. Yeah. I just constantly remind myself of that. And that makes me appreciate this little tip. This little blade and say, thank you God. For giving me someone, some people in my life. You know, I tip of the stick. I appreciate it that more. This tip can get smaller for all I care. You're not going to take away this joy from me. Amen. And there may be tips of the stick here that could just walk out and never come back to this church. But that makes the leftover tips even more valuable to me. That I want to work hard and fight for it and protect it with all I've got. Amen. Does that make sense to you or was that too deep? Look at that tip of the stick. You just, you just went, oh, I know. Oh, I know. Oh, I used it. And, you know, look at it again carefully. I hated the Bay Area. I, hate, I hated living here. The Lord transformed my heart, and it's hard for you to believe it, but I love living here now. You might say, why is that, preacher? I took time to explore more of the areas here and saw so much beauty when I went out with my family, I realized there were too many beautiful things they had here other places didn't have. I saw needs that I could do for the Lord that I couldn't do in the South or in other places. I saw more things I could accomplish, more things to appreciate. Now, perhaps even if I quit the ministry, I wouldn't want to move out of here. What's that? The tip of the stick. But I'll tell you, the first 10 years of my life doing this ministry, I hated living here. But God changed my heart. You know what? I took time to explore that tip of the stick. To look at it more. To search the blessings, things to enjoy. And it changed my preferences. Amen. You know what you're a prisoner to? Your fleshly preferences. Right. Because no matter how great the blessing God will give to you in your life, you will never appreciate his greatest blessing because you're locked and enslaved to your preferences. Come on. Until that is dead on the altar. And that dies. That fleshly preference dies. It's going to be by looking at that tip of the stick. Amen. My fourth point is the triumph of the stick. The triumph of the stick. The last part of the verse says, and he also delivered Israel. And he also delivered Israel. <laughs> that stick does work. See that? That stick delivers. That stick has the power. So, Shamgar, if you got your stick that God has given to you, my question to you is, is it delivering you? Come on, be honest. Is that stick really delivering you? Be realistic in your heart and in your mind. You can be honest. You don't have to say it out loud, but just be real. Is it truly delivering you? You know what I believe personally, since we live in America, it doesn't. You know why? You're still enslaved to that fast-paced fleshly preference and I just want to get it all solved at once kind of mindset. It's not delivering you, is it? Well, you know what the word of God says? It should. It should. It has the power. It should deliver you. So why isn't it? Could it be that there was something, some step, some little step that you overlooked that you need to go back to? Your Christian walk was probably a little bit too fast, wasn't it? And maybe you need to retrace your steps and find out which step you didn't really step in the right way. Does that make any sense to you? When I studied about swords being forged and built, it was pretty fascinating, a little complicated. Bayesian probability calculus was easier for me. <laughs> but forging swords, when I studied it, I was like, wow, it was interesting. A sword blade is impressive. It is the number one offensive weapon during the old days that you would use. 
Everyone took pride in swords. Sword is the emblem for real Bible believers, is it not? We always brag about the sword. It's not a machine gun, it's a sword, right? There's something about a sword that makes it so famous, valuable, and precious, and that's our offensive number one weapon. So, if I'm going to attack the gates of hell and conquer all my problems, I'm going to forge me a sword, a nice one, a sharp one, a big one, a swift one that I can move easily and, make, and it has a little bit of style and decoration. looks really cool. But that's not how you're going to forge a sword. Every person who starts using a sword or building a sword always starts out with not a sword but a dagger or a small or a pocket knife. You might say, why do they do that? Well, the reason why is because that blade is long. And that blade, you know what it does? You have to heat it. And heat is uncomfortable. And then when you heat it out, you take that hammer, and it's a lot of work, and then you pound that blade as the heat burns that steel. And what it's doing is you're flattening the blade. And then after that, you have to keep hitting it or hit the edges especially so it can start shaping. Because you know, that piece of steel is going to take some time. And by the way, when you're hammering that piece of steel, you're not hitting the whole sword. You know what you're doing? You're doing in one part of the sword. And here you are, you're hammering, and then you got to go, okay, the next one. And you got to hammer it. When I looked at that, I was like, oh, man, I don't want a sword after that. <laughs> hammer it, and then here's the next one. you got to heat this one, and then you got to hammer it. When you heat that sword, it doesn't heat the whole thing. You have to heat one part, and then hammer it. Heat the other part. Hammer it. Heat the other part. Hammer it. And then you're done once you reach the end, right? No, you start all over. Heat it again. Hammer it. Heat it again. Hammer it. How long? I looked it up. They said it'll take you hours. I'm like, <laughs> I don't want a sword. I want a pocket knife after that. You know why? For that blade to be effective and conquer your enemies, it takes a lot of fire and heat. The fiery trial that the Lord has to put you through. And by the way, that fiery trial is not going to just holistically clean off all impurities. It's just one part. And what you have to do is you take a lot of work and effort by hammering it away. And with that problem you're going through in life, you're hammering and hammering and hammering. You're trying to hammer through. And then guess what? You have to heat the next one. You got to hammer it through, hammer it through. That's what you feel like in life. You have to hammer through. But here's the thing. What would make that sword blade ineffective and inoperable and not a help to you, not efficient to you, is if you just hammered it and thought you were done and then moved on to the next one and then, oh, that was work. Oh, it was hot enough. I'm done. Let's go to war now. Now let's solve my financial problems with this. Now let's win my lost loved ones to Jesus Christ with this. Because they've been stubborn for years. Now I know that book. I'm ready. Now let's take on my health problems. Now let's take on a ministry and start a church and start a mission work. And you quit after that. You know why? Because there was something in that step, one of those steps. Not just one of those steps. Many of those steps in the middle you hammered, you bypassed and skipped through. So now, that's why your weapon to help you through life, conquer the problems in your life, is not delivering you. Now do you understand? You know why your methods in the Lord, your solutions that you're trying for the Lord are not working for you? It's very simple. It's because there's something in those steps you bypassed. And not just one step. There were probably a lot you missed out because you thought you hammered hard enough and you heated it hard enough and you're done. It's not that simple. 
You know what you need to do when you heat and hammer that thing away? You know, that part is not sharp enough, that edge. That's the step I missed. Right there, that step. Let's sharpen that edge more. All right, now I'm done. Let's look at the other side. That edge there, that's a step that I missed out. All right, now before I move, heat the next one, before I hammer the next one, let's take another careful look at this part that I heated. Did I really hammer the right way? No, that part still is missing. All right, now let's go heat up the next part. How many steps have you bypassed? How many edges have you skipped? How many parts you did not heat, surrender to the fiery trial of the Lord? Parts you didn't hammer, work hard on, that you just bypassed. Yeah, no wonder you're, you're struggling with your Christian walk. No wonder the devil's getting to you. You think that you're a unique person and that all these bad problems happen to you because you're just so unique. Your problem is so complicated. Nobody understands. You can't conquer a complicated problem by bypassing steps. If you really believe your problem is unique and complex and complicated, it should make you more focus on your basics that you skipped out. What is it? Is this some fleshly thing you're struggling with? Laziness? What makes you impatient that you can't be patient? You ever thought about that? Why is it you're not thankful? You don't have peace in God. Shouldn't you contemplate that a little more? What is it that in your prayer life, your Bible reading, you're just not doing right? What is the missing edge, the missing step? It's time to backtrack and see. That way you can get your blade sharp. And when you finish that blade, guess what? It's not going to be a sword. It's going to be an ox code. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I'm a Bible believer. I can use that sword. How about an ox goat first? Then let's see you handle the sword. Is your sword delivering you? Is this sword delivering you? If not, why? That's a simple question. Why? That's good. It's that simple. It's not complicated, it's not complex. Your problem and your life is not that hard. There's just something in here you bypassed, didn't you? Come on. In our lives, we cannot, we cannot use the basic little things because we always want something big. We always want something fast. Something that solves problems instantaneously and like I told you at the very beginning that's why we build up higher technology faster loading on the internet and access and that's why 6g won't be enough it'll have to be triple sixes after that G to get the speed that you want until you build a big tower of Babel that's what you want that's what our flesh is built upon we don't like those small things and I know it's hard to appreciate love those small things because we don't like we don't like how long it takes we don't like how it's going one by one and we want to be powerful strong ourselves i don't like the basic little things it's very demeaning it humiliates me what if god was like you then you thought about that what if god was like you i want something big i want something powerful i want something instantaneous if he had your human nature, you and I would have been zapped out of this universe a long time ago. Think about this. Thank God that he's not like me. Thank God he's not like me who doesn't appreciate the little things. I thank God he appreciates those little things. Because out of this entire universe that is so big, here am I just a little speck of that. Here am I, more demeaning, more debased than the angels. 
Here am I where God can just look at me and I drop dead. You thought about that? Thank God he did not feel like, oh, Gene Kim, oh, who cares about him? Bypass him, move along, I don't want him. He's a tip of the stick. Let me get someone better, someone more talented, someone more capable and, no, I thank God that he said, let me go back. Let me go back. I know I can create the whole universe in just like that. I said, let there be light, instantaneous. I said, let man be created, instantaneous. I can, I can do that if I want to, but I decide to backtrack a bit. Come on. Praise God. And be patient with Gene and say, hey, Gene, this is your same problem you keep bypassing. Let's do it again. Come on. Let's do it. And I'm like so ungrateful. I'm like, oh, God, I already know it. And then wouldn't God have every right? Wouldn't he be tempted to just go, do you realize that I could do the same thing too, but I'm not? If I can put up with you, you can put up with yourself. If I can put up with this problem you're going through, you can put up with that problem yourself. You know, 2,000 years is quite a long time. But God is still ever bearing, ever patient. And he says to those wicked human beings, those little specks, those tiny little tips of the stick, there's still some of you there that I appreciate. Can you see? Think about it. This, this place that we live in on earth is a tip of a stick, much smaller than that. And God keeps concentrating, focusing on that tip and say, I see something beautiful in it. I see some use that I can use it for my glory. You know, let me use it again. Let me give them another chance again. And not just the whole earth, even smaller than the earth. Smaller than a state. Smaller than a city. Smaller than a zip code. Smaller than even these people here. You. <laughs> you. You're the very tip of the tip of the tip of the tip of the stick. Do you realize that? And God says, I can be patient with you. I can use you. I can be merciful, gracious. I can still show love towards you rather than hitting you. I can still help you out. Man, I appreciate this. Thank God he's not me. Because I would have been sick and tired of me a long time ago. Amen. I would have threw me away a long time ago. But God, I thank God that he still appreciates me. What I'm doing for him. And that he'll take value in me and keep using me. If I, if I, if I can be thankful and grateful for that much, can I share, share the same patience and appreciation in return for that little thing that God gives to me. Oh, it changes my perspective in life. And look at that tip better and say, man, what a beautiful thing. What a wonderful thing. Ah, there were some places I misused it. I should use that better. I could do better. Let's look at our basic things in life and Let's thank the Lord for it, shall we? Every head bow and every eye shut.